Okay, we're going to start looking at streetcar name desire by looking at, um, <laughs> in this first video, the stage directions, the setting, uh, and the introduction of Blanche. So, the first thing you've got to notice, the difference between a poem, let's say, and a novel, uh, and a play, is, are the stage directions. And uh, Tennessee Williams is stage directions are part particularly elaborate and expressionist and poetic. And he takes a lot of detail that it might be worth thinking about how, how is the director supposed to interpret these, uh, some of the things, for example, lyricism or creating certain atmospheres. It's, it's very um, subjective, but Williams is almost like a poet or a novelist in the way he's describing the scene. Other playwrights are more minimalist in their stage directions and allow the language to set the scene. Williams is purposefully very detailed in establishing where we are and what the mood is. In addition, he sometimes gives insight into how lines should be read um, through stage directions too. Uh, so we're in a place called Elysian Fields, which is a mythical, so if I give you some AO3 here, it's a mythical, mythical, it's named after a mythical place. We are in actually New Orleans. We are in a specific place, home of jazz um, in the southern state of Louisiana. It's a place of music, of mixture of cultures, French, Creole, Haitian, um, a variety of s the different slave cultures, European cultures. New Orleans is a real mixing pot, a place where Williams himself spent some time. But Elysian Fields refers to a mythic, mythical place in, gr in Greek mythology where um, it's the afterlife for heroes. And it's worth thinking about why would he name this place that. And it's, it is poor, but it's got a rayfish charm, a kind of uh, a charm out of decay or, or slyness or, or trickiness. And, that, and that's what appeals to it. Uh, it should appeal. We shouldn't think it's a run-down place. And if you notice in the stage directions, he says it's almost a tender blue. You see what I mean? How, how am I supposed to make a tender blue if I'm a director? Not only a tender blue, but it's almost turquoise. Not turquoise, but almost. And it invests the scene with a kind of lyricism and gracefully attenuates the atmosphere of decay. That is some kind of sentence for stage directions, if you compared that to the last play you probably read was Inspector Calls. Um, there, is, there is now a, a kind of poetry in the way that Williams is describing things. So what we should take from that is there is a sense of decay here, but there is a sense of lyricism or beauty, um, and this, this tension is an atmosphere he wants to create. In addition, there's music, jazz music, and he says Negro entertainers. I think pointedly, uh, as you'll see later, he says, this is in New Orleans, where there's the easy intermingling of races, you see. Um, what he's trying to bring attention to is the South has a reputation for race division, but here, against type, you have race mixing. And again, he wants to create some kind of answer. Also, you'll hear, see Mexicans, and um, uh, Stanley himself is from... Uh, Polish stock. There is the sense of the city, as opposed to the South, which is very black and white, the city of New Orleans representing this mixture, um, this intermingling. Um, and this is the cosmopolitan world that we're in. And it goes against the South, um, the traditional ideas of the South as agricultural, um, the legacy of slavery. Uh, you know, these things haunt the play, primarily through Belle Reve, Blanche and Stella's past. But it, that conflict between the old, that old version of the South and this new South is quite striking. So what Williams does is, in addition to describing the scene, 
he gives a kind of pre-scene where there's a lot of, there's, it's a tableau, it's, there's a lot of different things happening to give you a sense of the atmosphere before we get the introduction of Blanche. So we have a Negro woman and she's telling a dirty joke. Uh, and she's in the middle of things. She says St. Barnabas would send out his dog to lick her. I don't know what accent I'm doing, sorry. Lick her? Dog to lick her? I mean, this isn't just a sexual joke. It's bestiality. It's particularly grotesque. And when, when he did, she'd feel an icy cold wave up and down her. And then, you know, this perverse pleasure. These are the first lines of the play. It's setting the tone for the sexual... Uh, and, and the perverse sexual nature of this place. A man's looking uh, for a place and they say they'll tap on the shutters. I think the idea here is he's looking for a prostitute. Probably. It's likely. Um, and then there's a warning the Negro woman gives that not to drink this one drink, the Blue Moon cocktail, or you'll be on your feet, suggesting perhaps that he could be drugged, or taken advantage of. So the initial atmosphere is, okay, so you get this tension between decay and lyricism, music, beauty, you know, this tension, but you also get this sexual opening, um, which is humorous, but also dark and potentially, given the larger scope of the play, destructive. Uh, and then we have the entrance of our two male characters, uh, Mitch and Stanley. They're at 28, 30. They're in worksmen's clothes. They're working class. Um, they're wearing jeans. They're going bowling. Uh, they're talking about a ga They're talking about gambling, and uh, even odds means y y y there is no sense of risk, and Stanley wants to have odds. You can make of that what you will. But Stella comes out, and Williams tells you right away that he, she's got a background different than her husband's. And obviously, obviously is the line to think about. So how do you indicate class? Um, is it through clothing? Is it through movement? But right away, background and class are established. You notice, you're starting to notice, you know, this is a tightly tightly written play, with even incidental details, setting it to the bigger picture. Um, uh, she mildly, you know, oh, don't holler at me like that. Hey, Mitch, catch. Stanley throws her something. What is this? Meat. It's just, you know, blunt. Pack. He heaves the package at her. She cries out in protest, but manages to catch it. She laughs breathlessly, you know. These gags, these things he does, she loves. She finds them amazing. Um, this could potentially be a moment of intimacy, of humor. It tells us something about them. Um, she, she also says more about herself because she says, can she watch him go bowl? Uh, what does that say about the relationship these characters have? Um, can I just point out to you, though, the colored woman, what was that package he threw at her? And she's laughing. Catch what? Uh, again, I think the fact it's meat. There is some sexual innuendo. And that j these jokes kind of show how the atmosphere isn't quite right here. It is fun, but there is a kind of grotesque um, uh, darkness and, and definitely sexual nature that tinges what's going on here. Uh, she keeps laughing and then we see Blanche come in. She's, she's carrying a valise, not a package of meat, a valise, a briefcase, a trunk maybe. Um, she's looking at a slip of paper, but the key thing is she's in disbelief. And that's because she can't, it's almost like she can't accept where she is. It doesn't make sense to her. Um, because she's incongruous to this. Side. She does not fit in. Like, talk about tension, lyricism, and decay. Now we get something. She, utterly, she's dainty. She's white. Her name, Blanche, French for white. Uh, white suit, fluffy bodice, necklace, earrings of pearl, white gloves. All in white. As if... 
She was coming to a summer tea or cocktail party in the garden uh, district. Sorry, a lot of why white is really predominant. Um, she's out of place. She really, and to understand how out of place she is, we can go back to the descriptions of the setting, but we can mostly just look at her and put her in opposition to everything in Elysian Fields. Um, dainty, delicate, her delicate beauty can't, must avoid a strong light. And there's something about her that suggests a moth. And the original AO3, that's the original, one of the original titles for this. Uh, and if you look at the cut, well, I don't know if I'll give you the cover, but the original cover of this play uh, for Methuen, the publisher was of a moth. Uh, moths are drawn to the light. When they go to the light, they extinguish. I think that symbol and the motif of light and darkness we're going to see carried out throughout the whole play. Um, Eunice, who lives upstairs, gets her. And the first thing we hear with faintly hysterical humor, she's anxious. Um, there's a real edginess to her, and she finds the absurdity and disbelief of her situation uh, 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 comes into the poetry. I mean, she brings up later Edgar Allan Poe, and I think it's almost like she's in a story. That's how she's writing. They told me to take a streetcar named Desire and then transfer to one called Cemeteries and ride six blocks and get off at the Legion Fields. It just sounds ridiculous to take something called Desire to the cemetery and then the afterlife. So it's desire leads to death and this kind of afterlife. Is it purgatory? Is it hell? Is it heaven? We don't know. But that is one of the major concepts of the play. It's one that ignited it in Tennessee Williams' own mind, the fact that there is the streetcar that goes in one direction to the cemetery in the other direction to desire. And there's something in that, symbolically, that tied desire and death in his mind. Um, so she's meeting Eunice for the first time. Um, she finds out that he's bowling. She's, she's, she, she's uh, in utter disbelief that this is the place, um, but it is. And Eunice says, look, I can let you in. She goes, well, how are you going to do that? And says, well, we, we own this place. So, I mean, the two families actually own this apartment. And based on their meager incomes, this reflects a kind of, you know, this place that they can afford living there. So then we get the first sign of this set. Um, it's a downstairs flat, um, the lighting brings attention to certain parts of the house. You have a kitchen, but it has a folding bed, and then beyond it is a bathroom. It's very small, is what's crucial, and the shared space is crucial. And that constriction, that claustrophobia of the play, the lack of privacy, Blanche's uh, dominance of the bathroom. That all comes out here. Uh, Williams is telling you so much just through looks. Blanche is not really liking it. And Eunice, defend, she's defending it. It's sort of messed up right now, but when it's clean, it's real sweet. That defensively is very... But this is their life. This is how they live. Well, Blanche is looking, you know, with the eyes of a kind of wealthy, privileged aristocrat, maybe. And Blanche wants to get rid of her, crucially. Just, yeah, thanks for letting me in. Go. Uh, Eunice uses some Mexican uh, there to show, I guess, as an attempt to show off her culture. Um, she's being polite. Oh, you teach. Um, uh, and background, you're from Mississippi. I... Stella showed me a picture of your home place, the plantation. Now, this is important because it's a very minor detail, but Stella does show people where she's from. And Stella is from the Old South, a plantation. They once had a lot of money. They came from um, culture and generations back. They were quite wealthy. And it's this wasting away, this... 
this inability to keep this up that's forced Stella to leave, and now Blanche has lost Belle Reve. I think it's interesting, it's a very small detail, but Stella does show Eunice, Stella does show Stanley, those big white columns. Those are striking. And for these people who aren't from that kind of wealth, that would be something, I think. It makes me think about, again, class and cultural tensions in the play. Uh, Eunice kind of spots it by saying, oh, it must be hard to keep it up. Blanche is pushing her off and says, look, 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 um, I'm just about to drop. I want to be left alone. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, Eunice is offended, though. So she says, oh, that's okay, but I'll get out of here. Um, so now we see Blanche alone, and I think it's important in the play when Blanche is alone, we see her in a different way. She sits in the chair very stiffly, with her shoulders slightly hunched and her legs pressed close together, and her hands tightly clutching, tightly clutching her purse as if she were quite cold. After a while, the blind look goes out of her eyes, and she begins to look around, slowly around. A cat screeches. She catches her breath with a startled gesture. Suddenly, she notices something in a half-open closet. She springs and crosses to it and removes a whiskey bottle. She pours a half tumbler of whiskey and tosses it down. She carefully replaces the bottle and washes out the tumbler at the sink. I've got to keep hold of myself. Secret drinking. She covers up. And she, t she t the audience sees her say, she's really, she's like, I, I've, I've got to hold my nerves together. Um, these first impressions of Blanche are worth looking at. Putting her in the context of Elysian Fields, putting her against that background, that contrast between her and what surrounds her, her conversation with Eunice, and finally, this secret drinking. These are all things I would think about in this first moment. I mean, look, I've just done a few pages and I've gone on and on. Um, in the next video, I'm gonna look at the interaction between uh, Blanche and Stella, including her speech about losing Belle Reeve, and then finally, her meeting Stanley for the first time.